Thank you very much, Mr. President. 52 compared to thousands, and uh, we're doing a tremendous job. And as you know, a big part of that job is ISIS, certainly the biggest, and Al Qaeda. And we, uh, we've got them down very low numbers. We'll have that totally taken care of in a very short period of time. And we'll see what happens. Uh, the Taliban wants to make a deal. We'll see if they want to make a deal. It's got to be a real deal, but we'll see. But they want to make a deal. And they only want to make a deal because you're doing a great job. That's the only reason they want to make a deal. So I want to thank you, and I want to thank the Afghan soldiers for really uh, looking to a lot of you today. And you say they're really fighting hard. I was very impressed with that, actually. So I want to thank you. And General Milley, again, to be at Bagram Airfield. I've heard so much about it. It's an incredible place. This is some some airfield, some fortress. Uh, I want to thank uh, all of the Afghan and Stanian troops. We have a lot of them here, actually. We have a number of them standing around. Jeremy Corbyn, 251. Poverty isn't inevitable. Things can and they will change. Dementia tax, gone. Millions losing their winter fuel allowance, gone. Fox hunting ban, gone. You, know, you got poll of this morning, the Conservatives on 48% of the vote, Labour on half that. We, the media, the pundits, the experts, no nothing. The biggest campaign growth since polling began. And in that election, we will commit to unleash the biggest people-powered campaign we've ever seen in this country and in this movement. Go fire on, catch a fade, you I'm wrong, I'm gone. Y'all can catch the wind that I am on, I am icon, y'all are wide wrong. Think that I'm a wrecking cyborg, so ain't nothing to it though. This is all me, ain't got much to do with who you know. Keeping it true to form, turn the L's into a milli though. But they already knew that those for well to your opinions, though that he is. We achieve all of these things by being a party and a movement totally and absolutely united to our common cause and purpose. Welcome to the Michael Brooks Show. We're broadcasting live from downtown Brooklyn, USA, where left is best as it is everywhere else, with super producer Matt Leck. Hello. Chief Economist David Griscom. How's it going? On this week's program, Camila Escalante of Telesaur. We're talking about the OAS's assault on hemispheric democracy, election results in Dominica, as well as the ongoing fallout of the coup regime in Bolivia and Evo Morales' as well as social movement strategies for fighting back. Chris Nineham, he's author of Warning to the British State. We're talking about the Corbyn Project, the UK elections. We're also gonna be making a plea, if you were in the United Kingdom, to vote for Labour. Save yourselves, help the global left. David Griscom is gonna give you a gem David, what is the gem? Oh, we're breaking down all the damage that Paul Volcker did in his life. Nice. 
because Paul Volcker was not good. Not In case that's all. confusing to anybody. Well, let's not give it away, because uh, one candidate shouted out Paul Volcker upon his death, and uh, one candidate that I actually was. think might be more left wing. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, we are going to be talking in the post game about Facebook and anti-Islamic politics from Burma to India, China and the United States. We've got a debunk with Ben Burgess. We're going through every single piece of Hillary Clinton's trash in the Howard Stern interview. <laughs> now we're going to check in with Yashka Fisher. What does the centrist European mindset think? in 2019 in the age of populism a throwback with stewart hall and much 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 more as there always is welcome everybody first we've got to talk about climate capital and authoritarianism the threat of climate change is international and this is kind of a cliche at this point but it's not a cliche when it's choking your lungs or flooding your city. And that's happening increasingly across the planet. Sydney, Australia is blank, is, is sort of enveloped with smoke and smog. Hospitals have seen a 25% spike in admissions due to poor breathing conditions in the city of Sydney. The smoke has come from the worst brush fire in the season in the area's history, coupled with a historic drought. And still, the Australian right-wing government, much like our own, refuses to address massive environmental catastrophe and continues to peddle climate denialism. But we need to prepare and fight two battles at once with the climate crisis. The global fascist movement, the authoritarian politics that are still so potent across the globe, yes, you have your idiot moron versions of Donald Trump, of Jair Bolsonaro, of the regime in Australia that still talk about climate change as a conspiracy, whether or not it's Leonardo DiCaprio setting the Amazon on fire, as Bolsonaro floated recently, or Donald Trump's very persuasive theory that climate change is a Chinese hoax. We know that the next wave that we are gonna see, whether or not it's in vigilante terrorism in the United States or more sophisticated populist forces in Europe, is to acknowledge the climate crisis and link it to a xenophobic far-right agenda. And that this politics, as always, will be facilitated, aided, and abetted by the failed neoliberal model that still is the prevailing model of global politics today. Eco-fascists use scarce re fear of scarcity to scapegoat immigrants and minorities. They use the rhetoric of environmental catastrophe to advocate for radical action on their own terms. Again, ethnostates demonizing and targeting minorities and refugees, ecological and otherwise. Marine Le Pen's National Party in France has taken an environmental plank on after years of outright denial. They've done this by making their environmentalism hyper-local and linked to their prevailing xenophobic agenda. The A AFD, fascist party in Germany, has taken a green stance. They've talked about better land management and animal rights while still denying the science of climate change and again, linking climate with their fundamentally xenophobic agenda. It shouldn't be any surprise that its leaders are connected to the right-wing pro-fossil fuel think tanks like the European Institute for Climate and Energy and the U.S. Heartland Institute. Climate change is also being used by the right wing to oppose Chinese and African development. In the U.S., the environmental movement has a complicated past. The Sierra Club used to be virulently anti-immigrant, and many other groups are more interested in preserving country clubs and hunting grounds than opposing pollution globally. Now, we need to have an answer on all of these grounds. People do need community. There does need to be local dimensions of environmentalism. There does need to be a sense of independence um, and power over one's own lives that is connected with the ecological movement. 
that truly empowers people, that is antithetical to the far right agenda, and of course, will never be recognized and facilitated by the neoliberal one. This is the type of work that Bruno Latour and Down to Earth gets to, of literally getting back down to earth out of these imagined globalization and anti-ecological projects. And the nationalist one is the same thing. It's another fantasy. It's another fantasy of retreat and barriers, unlike a fantasy of a globally managed neoliberal earth uh, subsumed by human desires and always taking the back seat. Look at the plans put forward by Emmanuel Macron. His primary initiatives have been to tax middle-class uh, consumption and has, of course, led rightly to the Yellow Vest movement. Look at Mike Bloomberg's authoritarian instincts and anti-poor policies. The Lib Dems in the UK always will prioritize protecting capital over any type of real green transition as advocated by Jeremy Corbyn and the Labor Party. They oppose Labor's plans to nationalize railways, to radically reduce emissions through public action, and to and provide a just transition for workers, which needs to be core and fundamental to any green initiative. Instead, the Lib Dems think that targeted taxes on consumption and a minimal increase in spending will curtail the crisis. Instead of targeting corporations and the system responsible, the Lib Dems expect the poor and working class to pay the cost, just as their corporate democratic friends and Macron uh, in France expect as well. This is a disaster on the merits and the politics of how to address the climate crisis and like everything else is the handmaiden of the worst, most dangerous forces in global politics today. The two approaches are both wrong. The Green New Deal is the way forward. Both eco-fascism and capitalist environmentalism function to protect capitalism. Eco-fascism uses the crisis to attack immigrants, fortify borders, but not rein in capital. None of these are fundamentally anti-capitalist projects. Capitalist environmentalism attacks our individual habits instead of major corporations that dominate our entire political and economic process. A Green New Deal, or labor's green industrial revolution have the necessary systemic approach to confront the climate and ecological crisis. Climate change is a systems problem. And without addressing that system that you've caused, you're just posturing or making the situation much, much worse. You guys have anything to add? I think that, um, to like, let's face it, just that brilliant, <laughs> that was incredible. Smart as hell. So run brilliant. Down so good. That you're not going <laughs> to, frankly, see many other places. Well, I mean, all right, let's go to the pitch. <laughs> you know, that's the thing, though, is that if we aren't able to win this debate, if we're not able to win this political solution, the right wing is going to be able to use it for very wicked um, ends. And you know, we're going to talk later about what happens when the right wing is able to take, uh, you know, control over a crisis. And when you're talking about a crisis like the climate crisis, which is literally an existential life or death crisis for many people, it's a very worrying thing if the left is not able to win this battle because the right can use this for devastating, devastating um, causes. And we're already seeing it. And it's very frightening, too, to see it start to percolate around like the radical right wingers, the murderers, the, the thugs who right. are you know creating terror around the world. Like They are citing ecological issues as a major uh, you know, uh, motivation for them to act. And we should be taking it very seriously. And this is another reason by this, this ridiculous framing of people need to accept the science is a dead end. I mean, look, of course, of course it's a problem. And of course it needs to be pointed out that major corporations like Exxon and many others have funded systemic propaganda efforts, including inside the science itself, which is another reason why you should not just sort of blindly worship science. They have been able to enlist scientists to minimize the climate crisis, to engage in denialism, to protect their industry, which is a fundamental threat to the human prospect, right? So, of course, that matters. But that being said, everybody is going to accept facts or science and filter it through their own pre-existing biases and belief systems. 
I, I really wanted to add, though, uh, you know, just on that is that's a big problem that we've seen with this whole like the liberal fetization of like Greta, for example. Right. And, you know, I'm not coming after her, but I'm t coming after all these liberals who for so long, they think that the only thing to do about climate change is just believe the science. Like there, there's not been a radical plan to deal with the amount of damage that we're doing to our uh, our globe. It's just been like, oh, well, we believe the science and our opponents don't. That's it. And you're seeing it now where like liberals, instead of getting behind plans like the Green New Deal or supporting labor, you know, they're wanting to put up murals of Greta, you know, and celebrating her and turning her into a pop culture figure, which she isn't even asking for, by the no, way. No, she's asking um, for action. Like, please act. And instead, you know, a lot of liberals for so long have thought that just because they believe in this scientific fact, that that's good enough. And they're substituting that for the necessary political action that's going to need to happen. Right. That's precisely right. Sort of like our dialectical forthcoming di conversation on dialectics. Forthcoming, our new a Think Tank episode for patrons coming soon entitled... Machiavelli is really good, though. <laughs> and he is. The left needs spirituality and Machiavelli. Badly. <laughs> this is a good time to play the clip. You're right. Today's, uh, tonight's shout out is a little bit different. We're going to talk with Chris Nineham about the UK election soon. But we really just want to urge you in whatever way we well, can. Well, can I play the can, what? I play, can I play the song? Play what? The song for the shout out? Oh, yeah, please. Of course. Shout out, shout out, shout out. My brain is still in recovery mode. It's such a good shout out, shout out, shout out. My brain is still in recovery mode. Shout out, shout out. From taking in so many highlights. I feel like there's a dim withedness and posturing that goes lib down. But of course, he's very, he's a, he's a right winger. So there's obviously the Tories. But I could see him getting enlisted to do some type of like Brexit channel for like Nigel for like looking at Nigel Farage telling him he could call it, him like it really, slurs or whatever. What it really depends on is if a Lib Dem will sit down with him and come to LA or not. Because if Joe not, Swinson then he's, had an interview with yeah. me. Exactly. If Joe Swinson came, yeah, Joe Swinson talk about came. markets. That would be so awesome if like Dave Rubin <laughs> does World War II and it was just all like totally contradictory because it was just based on pure. It's like, well, I supported Churchill and Hitler because Dave, they both talked to me. Dave would immediately put it in an American context. Be like, yeah, I just feel like the, the Democrats and Republicans, it's like labor and Tory. But you guys are trying something different. You have, it's actually the idea. So you're liberal Democrats, but you're not like liberal Democrats, yeah. though, right? Wow, you're blowing my mind. You should have called yourself the classical liberals. <laughs> They're basically the closest party in the world to that dumb description of oneself. Uh, friends don't let friends vote liberal Democrat. Guys, you got to vote for the Labor Party. You have to vote for them. I mean, look, honestly, in our case, our prospects are not bad. Bernie Sanders is surging. And the struggle goes on in any scenario. UK, United States, wherever, because the stakes are so fundamental. But if you guys, after 10 years of being devastated by these governments, reject an option for basic humanity and delivery now, you're locking in. I mean, devastating cuts, privatization, and also a geostrategic future that's delusional. They, they, the UK is not going to become the next Dubai or Singapore or anything like that, even if that's what you want. Power is not shifting towards the Atlantic. It's shifting towards the Pacific. And I'm talking now in very capitalist terms. This is not like that's where investment is going. That's where economies are growing. That's where the most of the population is. That is where the new geostrategic balance is coming from with China. Where are and so you've already owned gold with Brexit. And you've been destroying your social fabric for 10 years. And you want to do more of that? Gordon Brown was the uh, political partner and fierce rival of Tony Blair. And obviously, I mean, Tony Blair is clearly, you know, just a political figure of the right. But Gordon Brown is somebody who both for contextual, historical, and ideological reasons, embraced neoliberalism while attempting, and under his reign of Chancellor of the Exchequer, some actual redistribution. I think it's very important to watch what he said on UK television 
just the other day about the stakes of this election, because he's not only right about the UK, this does have some global ramifications. Um, do you look at the Labour Party now and think they're ready for government? Well, Jeremy Coleman is a phenomenon. I, I, we've got to accept that. He, he may have disagreed with me on many issues, but I respect... He certainly did. I respect... Well, he probably voted against me about 500 times. <laughs> did he ever vote I with respect, you? <laughs> sometimes. But I respect the fact that he, he's a phenomenon. And he is expressing people's anger about universal credit, about mm. what happened at Grenfell Towers, about affordable housing, uh, about inequality in our country, about tuition fees. And he is articulating that anger. It's absolutely clear to me that the old neoliberal consensus, you know, which was uh, basically inequality was good for growth and you never have deficit financing because that is um, uh, building up unacceptable debt. That's all gone. It's, it's completely discredited. It took 10 years from the financial recession mm -hmm. for it to be discredited. I couldn't win the argument about a stimulus for the economy in 2010. People were worried about debt and deficits and thought that it was the equivalent of incest. I couldn't win the argument with the people, and it's, I, I regret that because we then had seven years of wasted austerity, and this is a lost decade. But now people have come, both internationally and in Britain, to the view that the right form of economic policy is where you can combine social justice, economic efficiency, and environmental but, uh, sustainability, and there is a new wave of support for what you might call collective action in this country. And that's it. And, and by the way, because Boris Johnson and Dominique Cummings are smart, they understand that the sweet spot is some form of social center-right politics and lying. I mean, he says, look, I reject austerity. I'm going to pump a ton of money into schools and NHS. And his numbers have been bullshit. He's talking about future investments that are already allotted for. He's got no answer on the crisis in the NHS because of underinvestment where you have children sleeping on coats who have pneumonia. When it gets asked about this by a reporter, he blows it off. You guys have a choice. And there's a lot of drama and there's endless smears about Jeremy Corbyn. If you're worried about anti-Semitism and the rise of alt-right forces, that's another reason you need to vote for labor and vote for the only political factor in this race, namely Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonald, who have, and Diane Abbott, who have been fighting against racism and fascism and anti-Semitism and xenophobia for decades, while the Tory party has flirted with it and aided it. And honestly, the best case they can summon forward of a you know ultra sympathetic source to Toryism like Andrew Sullivan is that they've neutralized it by absorbing some of it. Right. Like that's their most <laughs> strategic, devious argument they have for what they've done. And yet all we hear all day is because somebody supports Palestinian human rights, that they're anti-Semitic. And that's already being used as a proxy against Bernie Sanders here. So don't fuck around. Vote for the Labor Party. I mean, especially when you're talking about just such a nasty, horrific, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim um, party that we're seeing the conservative party deform into. It's always been there, but it's very much coming up to the surface. This labor manifesto is probably one of the more radical and interesting movements um, in the West politically today. Totally. Absolutely transformative. Um, it's going to not only you know be able to address climate change, at the scale that it needs to be addressed, but doing so in a way that's going to bring in some people who have been left behind in the UK. In a lot of ways, you know, the United States and the UK are, have very similar trajectories over the past few decades, where massive amounts of financialization have completely decimated the working class in both of these societies, and things that were thought of as just like the normal path of life have been eradicated. There's a lot of young people who don't have a lot of options going forward. There's a lot of worry. And in that kind of moment, you have, you know, the racists and the xenophobes who try to, you know, take advantage of that fear to turn people into right wingers. Or we have the opportunity on the left, which is always looking forward. We don't live in the past. We say, you know what? We have an opportunity now to rebuild the world and we're going to do it. And that's exactly what the Labor Party represents. Um, it's absolutely the kind of movement that you're going to want to be a part of going forward. And for the sake of the planet, like, please do it, please. <laughs> yeah, for real. All right, let's. Uh, we're going to talk about why you should become a patron now. Um, but first, let's start by saying snag your tickets. February 7th, Bell House. We're live with the three of us, obviously. Alona Minkowski, pretty bad lefty Brandon Sutton, Harvey K, Ben Burgess, and Matt Binder. It's going to be quite a lineup, guys. 
Snag your tickets. I can assure you they're going fast. We sold out Philly weeks before that show. There was literally a woman. I had a really nice conversation with her in the lobby waiting to see if there were tickets left. That's a tough position to be in. I think it worked out for her, but just buy your ticket now so you don't worry about it. Um, we continue to grow, obviously, on Patreon, and I want to end this month really strongly. What I'd like is 3,200 by the end of the month as our end month number. Uh, so we're, that's and that's super conservative. We should be aiming for 3,300, but this is definitely a slow time of the year. As of showtime, we are at 3,112, and it's time to become a patron today. Next week, um, we're gonna do this a little bit earlier in the show and actually talk a little bit more in depth about the Sunday shows. Um, but I wanna kinda highlight something else, patreon.com slash TMBS. And if you're a $21 or above comrade patron, you get, we do the Skype calls, we just had a two-part a two part series with Joshua Khan Russell, which was awesome on organizing. There's so much to learn from him. We're gonna be doing more shows together soon, but it's totally a different experience, obviously doing the group call. And you support these video illicit histories, the next one of which is gonna be done in January uh, with Vic Viana about the Rand Corporation. And then we're gonna release on the YouTube channel the one that's available for patrons now on Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe. Um, these are really exciting. If you're a patron, you get them. You know, we put out one about every six, seven weeks, every two months. They're, they take, these are highly labor intensive. And I wanna be really clear, these are like full mini documentaries. They're like very highly produced. And what's awesome is that when you're at that patron level, you get them first, you're part of the process, but also this is like great content to see in the world. I wanna show you an example of one you can already watch with Milton Alamadi on the Congo and on our YouTube channel, there's a full illicit history playlist. So I would say become a patron at $21 above level if you can and support making these happen. And if you haven't watched them yet, go watch them on YouTube. Let's play this teaser. These who formed the first, he was one of the Congolese who formed the first national party. He became one of the leaders and he went to Accra Ghana, where Nkrumah had convened the All Africa People's Party. So when he came back to the Congo, he had an even heightened sense of nationalism, the role of Africa in the world, and the role of Congo in the world and in Africa. some protest against the Belgians, 30 people were killed by the Belgian authorities. And they blamed him and locked him up for quote unquote inciting violence. But they could not suppress the momentum for independence. Early in 1916, the Belgians called a conference in Brussels of all the Congolese parties. But Lumumba's party, which was the only really national party, the others were regional, more ethnic based, refused to participate. They said, we will not participate unless our leader is released. So they had to release him from prison and flew him to Brussels. And negotiations continued and the first elections were held in May 1960 and Lumumba's party won the largest margin. So therefore he formed the first post-colonial government Je vous demande de faire de ce 30 juin 1960 une date illustre que vous garderez ineffaçablement gravée dans vos cœurs, une date dont vous enseignerez avec fierté la signification à vos enfants pour que ceux-ci, à leur tour, fassent connaître à leurs fils so we're incredibly proud of these when you're a patron at that level it helps make them happen of course every patron 
uh, is great, and you get these really in-depth Sunday episodes, and the post games are highly fun. So patreon.com slash TMBS. If you haven't watched them yet, watch the Illicit History playlist. And also, I heard that 40% of you who watch these things don't subscribe on YouTube. Just click subscribe and click the bell so you can get all the notifications. We're going to take a brief break. And we'll be right back with Camila Escalante of Telesaur. Welcome back to the Michael Brooks Show. Joining us now is Camila Escalante. She's a presenter for Telesaur. Camila, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me on, guys. It's a great pleasure having you on. Um, Want to talk about a couple of different things in the hemisphere uh, that uh, you guys cover on Telesaur with a really important perspective. First, there were elections recently in Dominica uh, Prime Minister uh, Skurret was able to win re-election in a center-left platform. There was talk before from the opposition of the OAS calling these elections into question, which of course is becoming a really dangerous theme hemispherically. Um, but before we kind of get to that, what just happened in Dominica and what were the stakes of that election? Okay, so what we saw in Dominica is actually the turnout for the, the election was that the governing Dominica Labor Party overwhelmingly won the seats that were available. There were 21 seats up for grab, and they won 18 of those seats. But what we saw was a massive red flag along the way, which was the opposition and its national media within Dominica teaming up with international media and the OAS to fabricate these scenes of repression from the ground up in order to show citizens protesting against tyranny and then also these claims of possible fraud in the election. Um, and like all of that kind of made it seem like this election could have gone both ways, that there was so much opposition to the government. So this government has now been sworn in, or Roosevelt Scare, the prime minister, has been sworn in for his fourth term. But the Dominica Labor Party is now on its fifth term. And so the U.S. was really, and the OAS, were you know really itching to get them out. And um, But they really made it seem like the situation where 
over time, the government is actually losing support. And that's simply not the case. So, yeah, the, the opposition tried to tried to make a case in the way that we saw, you know, in Bolivia and Nicaragua and in and Venezuela that um, it's time for a new government that in order to cling on to power, they were going to do everything the government and the electoral authorities would do everything possible to rig these elections. And of course, the outcome is just unbelievably undisputable. All of the sort of roadblocks and violence and the media antics actually worked against them. What is the record of Roosevelt Scarrett? I mean, I've I've looked more into what's happening in Dominica and what's striking to me, and this is just like, I mean, it, 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 regardless of where this type of interference is happening, obviously Venezuela, Bolivia is unacceptable, but you're not talking about like a particularly radical government at all in Dominica. Why, what is it? that what does their record look like in power and what kind of even narrow steps do you have to take um, to become potentially a target of interference from the US and the OAS? Right, well, they do, I, the, the government and, and Roosevelt Garrett have promoted some social programs that are mm -hmm. arguably um, you know, much more leftist than what we, we would see from the opposition, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, Scarrett did a number of things in this tiny country of about 75,000 people to get on the bad side of Washington. And it, yeah, it does, it does tie back to Venezuela, the CARICOM, the Caribbean community played an indispensable principal peacekeeping role in the region since January of this year, when we saw the United States and the Venezuelan opposition attempt to install um, Juan Guaido in Venezuela. And so more mainstream media focus on the roles of Uruguay and Mexico and even Norway for facilitating talks. But CARICOM and the countries that make up CARICOM, which is St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Barbados, Dominica, Antigua and Barbuda, St. Kitts and Nevis, and even Trinidad and Tobago and St. Lucia, very vocally called for dialogue and made calls for non-interference, saying that the Caribbean has to remain a zone of peace. You might have seen these, um, you know, at the United Nations General Assembly, we saw Barbados um, Prime Minister Mia Motley making this plea as well. And so Venezuela is a Caribbean country and a close neighbor, a next door neighbor of Trinidad and Tobago. And, um, you know, between January and April in particular, we thought that there would be a high possibility of U.S. military intervention around Venezuela. And those provo pro provocations were not just coming from their main, from the U.S. main base in Colombia, where the Colombian government is just an extension of the U.S., but the provocation was being staged in the Caribbean Sea. So some of these governments are not even firmly behind President Nicolas Maduro, per se, all of the time, mm -hmm. but they recognize the need to defend their territory's sovereignty from being used for war staging. And of course, this is also a government, uh, the government of Roosevelt Scared is also a member of the Alba TCP block. And I think it, I think it would be, you know, kind of silly to like, um, assume that the United States wants some sort of natural, specific natural resource within all of these Caribbean states. Mm -hmm. I think Washington is actually just fighting to maintain its hegemony throughout the region. And there are of course, other reasons to invade Latin American countries besides just lithium and gas. So right. what they're trying to do here is dismantle the block of small countries, which has put themselves at massive risk. This is a massive risk they're taking by standing up and siding with Venezuela in some cases and publicly opposing the unilateral course of measures, the sanctions on Venezuela and Cuba. Um, and, and by them doing that, by Roosevelt Scarrett doing that, um, in the UN, through CARICOM, um, it is creating some semblance of balance of power in the region. Yeah, we played Mia Motley on this show, and actually we have a good uh, friend, and uh, uh, Dave from Jamaica, who calls from Jamaica, and uh, he rightly was like, hey, I mean, that was great, but what does that mean when a prime minister or leader from a Caribbean nation state uh, so aggressively, even rhetorically, rejects, you know, U.S. imperial posturing as, you know, she did, obviously, with 
the U.S. interference and attempt to dislodge uh, the Maduro government. So these are so that makes a lot of sense in terms of contextualizing uh, Dominica. Now, absolutely. Wanna, yeah, go ahead. And let me see. He's not. I mean, he, he's Roosevelt Scared is not the only one. I mean, the most explicit. I mean. You know, some people say the, the most socialist person of another small Caribbean island state is the prime minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Ralph Gonzalez. And he's also spoke very openly, very explicitly against U.S. sanctions. And, um, you know, he's very uh, openly anti-imperialist and a, a friend of Venezuela and Cuba. I just saw him at the beginning of November in Cuba and Havana at this international, um, you know, solidarity conference with Cuba. And he's a very principled man. And what he said is that the United States is doing in Venezuela should be investigated as a possible war crime. And he says that Venezuela is being targeted for ideological reasons, not for any sort of democracy or freedom or peace. The United States is inciting war in plain sight. Um, and, you know, all throughout the world, the media is skewing this reality. And so what St. Vincent did um, is they actually ran for a non-permanent seat at the UN Security Council. And so the UN Security Council, um, so that was in June, they actually won that seat, and which was pretty major for the Caribbean, and it was celebrated there. Um, and of course, uh, Washington was pushing um, a seat for Nayib Bukele in El Salvador, who's the new right-wing president. Um, but this year, the United States tried to take Venezuela to the UN Security Council um, to try to take action. And of course, permanent members, China and, uh, and Russia actually blocked that. But this is giving, uh, allowing St. Vincent to take a seat is actually giving more voice to, you know, some of these smaller states. But actually, it's, it's what it translates to is giving more voice to the region. Because now, uh, you know, now a dissenting voice that goes against Washington is able to stand up against them in the international arena. Yeah, absolutely. And I just always want to reiterate that really any separate track conversation that people want to have on the complexities of Venezuela and any objections people may have to this or that policy in Venezuelan, uh, you know, in the Venezuelan government is, is irrelevant in many respects, almost all respects to this broader objection to uh, U.S. regime change efforts, and also this bigger conversation about autonomy, sovereignty, um, and actual co-equal partnership in the Caribbean and Latin America with the United States, which is, of course, obviously never been the case. I want to go to Bolivia um, in the last section of time we have, uh, and I guess we'll just start with what's awful and then maybe some potentially encouraging signs. But can you just talk a really <laughs> okay. di distill for no, us in the last couple of weeks really the good. nature of this regime? It has been so obscene that even a lot of people who were doing some you know, foolish liberal posturing in the first weeks after the coup um, have had to take a step back because apparently... A right-wing coup against Evo Morales is not being led by people that are concerned about water pollution. They seem to have some other political motivations at work. Right. And I think this like liberal posturing is like really key to what happened here and why um, the international media played, um, you know, uh, they played a heavy hand in the coup because what we have had for years now in Bolivia. So this is what separates Bolivia, I feel, from countries like Cuba, where there is a lot more. Cuba actually has its own English language media. You know, Venezuela has Telesur English, um, also Venezuela analysis. But Bolivia has actually had, had, had has not had its own um, sort of like leftist or mass aligned or people aligned media in English or internationally. Even Spanish coverage has been very bad for Bolivia. What we have seen is these sort of like NGO people, liberal environmentalists, people trying to, uh, you know, cover Bolivia on the issues of, you know, feminism, their liberal feminism, their fake environmentalism, all while tokenizing indigenous people. So that has been right. a massive injustice. And the reason why we don't understand the way things actually work on the ground, what organizing looks like, how the mass is actually constructed. So that has been a massive disservice uh, of the international left um, in not covering Bolivia. And that's why what happened since the coup was parachute 
journalism because people didn't understand anything that happens. You know, people had to orient themselves very quickly. So, of course, we've been covering Bolivia for so long without uh, any sort of class analysis. We've actually been systematically omitting any type of class analysis um, while trying to throw in these issues of like feminism and everything like that. And so actually the right wing was able to, yeah, they were able to use that. And then they're using these issues of like feminism, even violence against women, environmentalism, the fires in Bolivia against Evo Morales. And so that is something, you know, that, that is our fault, us in the media, the English speaking media. And so, yeah, so I mean, what I what I spent a lot of time doing when I was there was visiting with the relatives of victims of the two major massacres in two different parts of the country. So um, the relatives, some victims themselves who survived and other witnesses, other residents of the area. So one of them was um, the one was in uh, the first one was in Cochabamba, the department of Cochabamba, um, and it was a. Uh, near the Cocalero region, I guess. It, it was, uh, you know, this is a very strong, uh, it's a mass stronghold. It's an area this that really supports Evo Morales. This is just for people, that's the, that's the political party of Evo Morales, mass. Yeah. Yes, the movement towards socialism is the party of Evo Morales. And so this is a, a mass stronghold. So following the consolidation of the coup, these people erected roadblocks for kilometers and kilometers. Um, absolutely everything was completely shut down. Even now, um, so a lot of the roadblocks or most of the roadblocks, all of them perhaps have been lifted, but there's basically no medics. There's no police. There's no fire department. There are no emergency services because the coup government and the police and military completely abandoned the area because they understand um, they understand the sort of resistance organizing that's going on there. And they know that it's absolutely not a place for them to be. So they've abandoned their posts. There's completely empty police stations that people can just walk through in that area. So, um, so yeah, what the first massacre took place there on November 15th. And uh, that nine people were killed there, um, and they were killed by uh, military, by the military, and by guns. And this is something that the that the prosecutor and the government and the military and police have denied. They've said that um, bullets were not found in the bodies. And of course, the you know the like human the ombudsman, what we call the defensoria there, um, has said that absolutely every single patient that came or their relatives or whoever found them and grabbed them off the ground came with bullets. And so this is something that's being disputed. But of course, the Argentine delegation in solidarity with Bolivia, which is all these like intellectuals, social movement people, most notably from the movement Patria Grande, they were there and they interviewed people just as I did. And of course, their findings and their report said the same, that there were bullets found. And this is just unbelievably indisputable. And people have video evidence photos. I myself do as well. And so that was the first massacre. The other one took place um, trying to lift roadblocks around the Sencata gas plant, which is in the city of El Alto, which neighbors La Paz. So that's actually the gas distribution plant, which services the city of La Paz and all the rich people in the Zona Sur, all the people who support, um, you know, Carlos Mesa, which is the second place candidate who, you know, uh, came in second after Evo in the in the elections, but also that some people who support the far right, which is from Santa Cruz. But they but there are some of those people in the, the Zona Sur of of La Paz as well. So they were at risk of seeing, you know, some major shortages because of these road blockades in these two areas. And then the gas sh shortage was a huge problem. So, of course, they carried out a military operation. Nope. Oh, did we lose you? The massacre of 10 people. We lost you for just a second there, but we got, actually, we got that, which was the, the second massacre. We only have a little bit of time left, but I want to ask you just two different questions at that time. So one You've talked about some of the organic organizing inside Bolivia. What do you make also of Evo Morales? I mean, he's been giving interviews, he's traveling, obviously he was granted asylum by the AMLO government in Mexico, which is significant. Um, and he's definitely talking like somebody who's obviously, I mean, he's been deposed by a coup, but he's strategizing, he seems to have a plan. Uh, I don't know, I mean, what do you think of the sort of broader viability of resistance to what's happened in Bolivia? 
Yeah, absolutely. So when he left, he was at risk of falling off the map. That's always a risk or of becoming illegitimate for other reasons. You know, the right wing could have been more successful in saying that he is inciting violence and sedition from the exterior. Um, you know, they were able to round up a lot of, you know, journalists, a lot of analysts, a lot of political leaders, both social leaders grass from the grassroots on the ground and also um, political leaders from the elected mass. But, um, you know, they weren't able to turn it around on him. Actually, what we saw is an outpouring of support internationally when all these people who should have been in solidarity to begin with kind of realized the, the gravity of what happened. So I think that he's stayed really relevant. I mean, if we're going to speak in terms of social media following, what he's doing on social media is doing very well. Right. These um, exclusive interviews that he's doing are doing very well. And so, I, a lo I mean, I think a lot of people's, like, number one question to me has been, um, when do you think he's going to come back? He's going to return to Bolivia. And I really don't know the answer. And I don't know what strategically would make more sense to do either. Because I actually think that the, the roots, the, the grassroots, the base, of the of the mass is uh, powerful enough, um, organized enough uh, to be able to run candidates without Evo in the country, and um, even without him playing a major role in the election. So I do think it's re I think what he's doing right now is political leadership, and it's very important. And I think it's a really good move to keep himself relevant, to be able to give that massive endorsement to whoever the grassroots decide to promote up to be. Um, possible candidates and whoever ends up being the final candidate. And I think it's really important that he's this person who's kind of like collecting and disseminating information at the top, but not necessarily back in the country yet. Um, final question. The linkage through all of this is the, is the OAS, the Organization of American States, which there's a long history here as kind of a proxy of U.S. influence in the region. And clearly this is... I mean, it was an interest of previous administrations, obviously, but there's been a really aggressive take by the Trump administration. And I want to say really counter to a lot of the delusional narratives you hear from some people of taking, you know, Trump's rhetoric that he sometimes will drop about war and this type of thing at face value, um, you know, particularly hemispherically, they've been very aggressive. But what is this new... OAS deployment, I guess, you know, specifically in reference to Bolivia and Dominica in terms of um, the OAS versus democracy, the OAS versus the left, the OAS as this sort of new kind of like pre-election call proxy. Well, some, um, I think some Caribbean leaders and um, probably other social movement people have, have stated repeatedly that it's it wasn't always like this. It, it is that, um, you know, that Luis Almagro himself is taking more unilateral decisions that are not representative necessarily of this horde of countries that actually usually falls underneath um, Washington's guard. In this case, he's actually, um, you know, he, he's just consulting directly with Marco Rubio and um and and just like you know issuing statements which question the decision of governments and saying that this whole sea of countries from the region are also signing on to these positions which is not necessarily true but um you know u.s intelligence and the oas are everywhere and they are you know um because these two entities are of course related and have overlap but they're prepared to overthrow you know, any country's government, including the very people they installed, like Juan Guaido. They're, I mean, they've been prepared to, to get rid of Juan Guaido for many, many months now. Um, and so, you know, they're, they're always looking for an opportunity to, you know, exercise control within a, within a given country. And I don't think, um, and, and I don't think it's like it, it's happening all of a sudden. I think it's been yeah. happening for a few years now, but they've just been planting in different places. And maybe now because they're maybe they're they're sensing a resurgence of the left in the region and they feel that threat that they have to um, that they have to, you know, try to do do different situations at the same time. And of course, they're, they're feeling a, a great deal of threat again, by Venezuela and the movement of the non-aligned, which, which are always talking about multilateralism. And OAS, the OAS is the enemy of multilateralism in the hemisphere. And they don't want the, these Caribbean island states or any country 
to exercise sovereignty over their territory. And so, um, yeah, like they're, they're seeing that people are trying to create balance through their respective regions and um, they don't want the distribution of power and influence to at any point become more democratic. If any piece of comedy comes out of all of this, it's definitely the Juan Guaido periscope coups. They were kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> results are horrible, but watching him get out there on a live stream, be like, all right, it's time. Uh, <laughs> well, it's uh, so awkward. I just, I just am wondering when it's going to end. I mean, I feel like it's already ended. I haven't seen anything he's done in months. But no, I think they're um, going to retire him. Um, it, one could almost feel bad for that guy, except not. Uh, <laughs> Camila Escalante, presenter for Telesaur. I really appreciate you uh, joining us and taking us through this stuff. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Uh, all right, folks, we are going to do a gem, and then we're going to talk to Chris Nineham about a warning to the British state and the Corbyn project. But first, David Griscom is going to desecrate the memory of the recently deceased Paul Volcker. We were classy about McCain, Am I good? relatively speaking, but I don't think we're going to be classy about Volcker. Is no, we right? definitely need to talk about him because I really want to make sure that people understand exactly what he did and what he was responsible for. I know people on the left, sometimes when they hear people work for the Federal Reserve, they just treat them as bad guys. And that's probably a good uh, first reaction. <laughs> but it's important to also understand like the role that these people play. And they're very significant in our economy. So, you know, Paul Volcker was put in as, as a Fed chair by Jimmy Carter, who's also somebody else who we need to have a reckoning with, too. Ooh, music to Harvey K's ears. No, I mean, seriously, he brought yeah. in this, uh, he brought in a whole era of, uh, you know, destruction. To Deregulation the and class. austerity, and for and, sure. And it's coming in, but Volcker was a real driver of that. So when Carter's in power, and Carter brings in Volcker, uh, the United States was at a historic level of inflation huge problem. It's also a major change after uh, the end of Bretton Woods when the United States moved off of the gold standard. Um, so completely different economy, a lot of volatility in the markets, people very freaked out. I mean, you know, gas prices were skyrocketing. Um, so Volcker is supposed to come in and, you know, fix the economy. It's very important to note this too, that Volcker specifically said when Jimmy Carter offered him the job, I want complete independence. And this independence of the Federal Reserve under Volcker becomes a religion that still exists today where it's an apolitical organization. Whenever we see these apolitical organizations, we should always be worried because that typically means that they are serving the interests of the ruling class. Let me just quote our good friend, ideology Smith. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> right? So, so here's what happens. So there's a massive uh, inflation crisis and Volcker comes in and he jacks up the federal funds rate um, to historic levels uh, to 17.6%. I'm put up this graphic right here just so people see how... Um, significant this up. was. Yeah, I got it up. Okay. Um, so Volcker puts up this massive Fed uh, funds rate. Huge. It causes a massive recession a year later. Um, massive unemployment, you know, real calamity for everybody else. And he cuts it again briefly, as you see in this chart, and then he raises it again um, to, uh, to 19%, which is just unheard of. Um, it's such a high rate. And essentially what that means is that's the price of money in the economy. And there are two very different... Uh, functions of capitalists, right? There's industrialists, the people who like own the the companies that are producing goods, and then there's like financiers, there's rentiers who are basically they want to get interest and they also want to get money back on the rents on the things that they already own, right? So industrialists want money to be cheap so that they can borrow money cheaply um, and use that for production. Financiers enjoy to have high profits and a great way to have that is a high rate of return on your interest. Um, so when he started pushing this. It was not very, it was very controversial even amongst the capitalist class, but he had a, a very famous line that he pulled in a, a bunch of the ed editors of the Wall Street Journal. And he said to them, when there's blood all over the floor, will you guys still support me? Oh, well, sounds nice. And they said, sounds very progressive. <laughs> and, and they said, mean. and they said, yes. So basically what happens when Volcker raises these interest rates to these absurd, you know, high levels is it zaps a lot of money out of the economy. So all of these industrialists, all these people who own companies, what do they do? They're not going to cut into their profits. So they attack workers, they cut their wages, um, they fire people, um, they start to get rid of protections that workers have. Remember, we're coming out of a period of time where the American working class was at one of its strongest, yeah. high union dense, higher union density, obviously, than today, very militant, lots of strikes. And Volcker basically 
imposes this, you know, ham-fisted discipline on them by basically throwing a lot of people out of the job because he made the find the economy um, so difficult for people for for growth for these uh, industrialists to be able to borrow money. Now, at the same time. Um, this also had a massive effect on the global south and other developing economies because they saw one the inflation um, and then two this massive return um, that they were expected to pay this higher interest rate was so devastating that uh, Volcker actually got the IMF in so when we talk about these IMF loans that came into a lot of South America and Latin America where they said okay you know deregulate your economy get rid of workers protections all this stuff this was coming out of a crisis that started in the United States that was very much imposed by the Federal Reserve and by Volcker. So, you know, it's very important to remember. So Volcker basically decimated labor um, by creating an artificial crisis that uh, made it very difficult, made it so that capitalists had an excuse to lay off of lots of amounts of workers. And it's still a fear that exists today. People still are afraid of losing their jobs because they remember this crisis that happened in the 80s. And then you go from Carter to Reagan. And this is where you get the deal that basically created the new economy in the United States. And it's very interesting that it also mirrors very similar to what happened in the United Kingdom. That basically, um, you know, they create this crisis, crisis in industry and this boom for finance. So what do you say if you're, you know, an economist or even just like a policymaker? Well, it looks like in the economy, the only functioning and profitable part of our economy is actually finance. So we should really focus on finance and let it become unleashed. So that's when you see all this massive deregulation. That's when you see a complete shift in the American corporation. The corporation becomes financialized. For a long time, financiers and like CEOs were a class that were, were butting heads. Basically what happens during this period of time under Volcker's reign and then under Reagan is the CEO becomes, you know, an agent of financial capital. So that's when you see their pay packages moving from, you know, just pure compensation to being, a, you know, tied to the shareholders. That's when you see CEOs moving from being, you know, former workers or people who like know the industry well to just MBAs who just know how stocks work and how the market works. I mean, this was a fundamental transition in the American economy and the global economy that was created to combat and defeat labor. And so when we're talking about something like Volcker, we need to remember that this was an agent of, of chaos, of chaos imposed by the capitalist class on the working class to completely decimate us. Um, you know, it should be noticed, noted that, you know, Volcker was eventually fired by Reagan because he didn't want to deregulate the economy enough. Um, so it's a good well, that's the question I have, because that's yeah. going to take us to uh, our our um, person that we still need to clarify, mm -hmm. Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> so the reputation that Paul Volcker has in today's world is of being an advocate during the early Obama administration of relatively and I use that word relatively, tough financial regulations mm -hmm. post Wall Street meltdown. And of course, the infamous Volcker war rule. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to explain all that in a second, but I just want to read. Let's just, can we go ahead to put up this Warren tweet? Yeah, we should. I got it. This is Elizabeth Warren tweeted this out. Few people, this is what's really funny is that the first sentence is totally true. Few people have had more of an impact <laughs> on our modern financial system than the great Paul Volcker, except for great. For more than five decades, he fought for a more robust, efficient, and effective rules to keep the U.S. economy safe. I'm very sorry for his loss. Now, of course, of, uh, <laughs> sorry for his loss, sorry for his family. Let's, as always, maintain some decency here. But this is stunning, and I'll throw it right back to you, David, but I just really want to underline, this distills everything that's wrong with the insane framing of her as some type of progressive alternative to Sanders, because it isn't just like, let's freeze frame history to the last 15 years or even the end of the Reagan era, maybe. And you say, there's a couple of techno fixes that he advocated that were relatively speaking more liberal than not, although they could still easily be subverted and the Volcker rule was, but mm -hmm. You're including in that several decades, all of the war on labor that Volcker waged. Mm -hmm. So you really are showing, I mean, a lot, you know, the kind of best defense of Warren that she had like on The Breakfast Club was basically, I didn't really think about politics until several decades into my life. Mm -hmm. But what she is showing, and I, a lot of people have followed this trajectory. It's a fine trajectory, it's just not my politics. They were Reaganites. Then they got into the Clintons because they wanted uh, what they thought was credibility on markets and the economy, but they were a little bit more socially tolerant. And then through the 
process of the Bush era and the Wall Street meltdown and the failure of Obama to rein in total financial excess, they have been in the modern context some type of progressive. Mm -hmm. Now, that's fine, but that is diametrically opposed to somebody who fought all of the stuff tooth and nail for decades. And it also shows a fundamental ideological difference because Bernie Sanders doesn't need to know all of these various tricks and nuances mm -hmm. and all this mishigas. He just wants to attack capital on behalf of labor, which exactly. is the power understanding that's completely missing from this. Anyways, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's a very important point because the thing is like when you read just people who are in the financial press or people who just think of the world like neutrally as like, well, not neutrally, but you know, in that sense of like policymakers, right? They're not involved right. in like the class war or anything like that. You know, Volcker's often talked about as being very brave for what he did, for example, right. you know, when it came to, uh, you know, the inflation crisis. But people like Volcker, their orientation was always going to be toward protecting certain people. And look, the capitalist economy can, fun like, Volcker could look out for capitalists and also prevent like a massive crisis. Um, so like Volcker's idea basically like the Volcker rule um, was trying to prevent banks from being engaged in the kind of risky trading that they were involved in with funds uh, that were backed up by, you know, you and I, right? Normal people. Right. What happened with the Volcker rule, specific and it's not even necessarily like a bad rule, right? No, it's, um, it's good. You know, it makes sense, right? Of course. But, like, the the problem with the Volcker rule is that they literally had like Goldman Sachs sitting in the office when they wrote it. And they wrote that rule to be very complicated and confusing. So then under the Trump administration, those same people, this, literally some of the same lawyers who helped write the rule were like, this law is very confusing. We don't know how it works, right, ever. So we need to get rid of it. So it's just a great example of like how this kind of regulation fantasy really falls apart as long as you still are you know, looking out for that group of people, the, the capitalists, the financial elite first, right? And I'd also like to add that, you know, Volcker really represents um, a kind of economic outlook that is so upper class in nature and that it looks at like the pain and suffering as, of like the American worker as just like a necessary evil for like the forward progress of this machine that is literally crushing people. So yes, Volcker might have prevented like a larger like inflation crisis. Um, there are other options, other things that he could have done, but to sacrifice the working class versus sacrificing the short term profits of the capitalist class was never even an equation in his head. And it's something that was very important that we remember that a lot when we're talking about these organizations, especially like the Federal Reserve, as it has been, because people always get mad at me when I say this, as it has been functioning and has it has functioned historically, has always been an organization that has been designed to protect the interests of the financial elite. It's never been an organization, literally, like there was a massive leak a couple years ago that had all of these emails from the Federal Reserve. They pay so much attention to labor negotiations and they are basically praying that like, you know, the AFL is not gonna be able to push up right. um, the, the amount of money that they're getting because they are worried about higher wages for workers. It's all a part of the balance that they're trying to create. And you know, sometimes they do things to contract profits in the short term for, for capitalists, but they always do it in the long-term goal of the capitalist class. And we need to fundamentally uh, change that. And the first thing we need to do is to get rid of this apolitical idea of the Federal Reserve being something above politics, because it's always been used as a way um, to prevent it having any um, responsibility for what it's created. Absolutely. All right, folks, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a brief break. And then Chris Nineham is going to join us to talk about the UK elections, the nature of the British state, Jeremy Corbyn. Then we're going to do a mini illicit history of what's happened in Afghanistan because of these Basically, the Pentagon Papers of our times have been released, and it is barely noticeable because the longest war we have ever raged gets no attention mm -hmm. and something that implicates the entirety of South Asia. So we're going to talk about that, and then we're going to go to the post game. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back.
an agenda that I objected to because while I was working on those streets, watching those folks see their jobs shipped overseas, you were a corporate lawyer sitting on the board of Walmart. Politics has gotten just so out of whack, but it's going to come back and whack. Appreciate it very much, Tim Apple. It is very, very disturbing when I hear the millionaire or billionaire word, and I've told them to stop it, knock it off. It needs to be simple. Keep it simple. Welcome back to the Michael Brooks Show. Joining us now is Chris Nineham. He's joining us from the United Kingdom right now. He's author of a new book, The British State, A Warning, which is available from Zero Books, which is also publishing my book, I should say for full disclosure. He's also an organizer of the anti-war movement in the United Kingdom. Chris, thank you so much for staying up late and being with us. Appreciate it. Not at all. It's good to be on the show, Michael. Chris, Earlier in the program, we played a clip of the former prime minister and chancellor of the Exchequer, Gordon Brown, saying that the neoliberal model was discredited and that Jeremy Corbyn is a phenomenon. In this relentless onslaught of anti-Corbyn bias in the press across the board, this constant effort of Tony Blair and other right-wing forces in the Labour Party to undermine him, even though Gordon Brown is definitely not as high profile or as popular, but he was kind of the economic brains of new labor. What is the significance of him specifically acknowledging that? Yeah, it was an interesting um, moment. And I think, I mean, Gordon Brown, although he, he was in the Blair government, his instincts were always a bit more what we call old labor, a tiny bit more kind of um, uh, redistributional and so forth. Um, and... I guess what's really happening here is that, you know, some of the people from probably a minority, actually, but some of the people who were involved in the Blair uh, project are beginning to realize that it was um, wrongheaded and it was a disaster. And um, they're definitely, I mean, Gordon Brown's definitely right about that. Um, and, and I guess also there's a wider sense. I mean, you can read it in some of the financial papers in Britain that, you know, even some corporate leaders and so forth are worried about the way neoliberal capitalism is going and how it's losing its its legitimacy. And I think the more far-sighted say, members of the establishment are recognizing that there needs to be, you know, at least some kind of a a move towards uh, a bit more welfare, a bit more redist a bit of redistribution, um, and some regulation. I think these are things that are being discussed amongst the sort of liberal side of the even the banking community. Um, not that there's anyone who's actually pretty, you know, very keen to really do anything about this. Yeah, it's I was going to say. I mean, how do you square that with you know the new statesman? 
very publicly and very melodramatically letting them, you know, everybody know that they couldn't endorse this Labor Party. Um, Rory, uh, uh, someone used, I forget now, uh, someone used the example of Martin Wolf, who's the Financial Times columnist, who's longer than most actually been saying we need to get real about the inequality crisis in the financial mm-hmm. sector. But he's now having conniptions and catastrophes about labor. What do you make of that contradiction? And then maybe if you could, could you bridge that with your book, which is really fascinating because to me, I I got more of an understanding than I did before because Corbyn obviously represents a certain quote unquote radicalism given how far to the right the global economic arrangement has become. But in terms of reality, it's a moderate and you know just solid social democratic program. But what I got from your book is that even something as modest as what he's talking about is not only going up against modern neoliberalism, but a really bigger continuity of the British state, the British establishment. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that thesis and connect it with why, how that manifests in the media bias against him, including the people who on one hand can you know, wring their hands and get so worried about all these problems, but then the next oh my God, Jeremy Corbyn, we can't possibly have him. We can't possibly do anything about it. Yeah, well, these are very deep and important questions. I mean, and I think one way to understand it is this, that in the period after the Second World War, when you had um, in Britain and in in many countries in the West and and elsewhere, actually, when you had um, a more statist kind of interventionist uh, kind of economic setup and there was you know obviously part of that was um spending more money on welfare and the recognition of the kind of demands of uh, or at least some of the aspirations baseline aspirations of, of the working class that was at a time when um capitalism was you know in rude health it was the long boom it was a time when you know profit margins were relatively healthy uh, growth was uh, good. Productivity was increasing in large parts of the Western uh, economies. And so there was a sense in which, you know, the establishment, the ruling class were, were happy to bear that. Um, plus, it was something that was going on around the world and therefore, you know, was less of a challenge to, compet- uh, to, to um, competitiveness. Um, and, and even you could argue that <clears throat> there were some reasons why, it was actually it actually directly benefited the ruling class to have sections of um, the economy under state control. That whole paradigm obviously started to fall apart in the 1970s. There was the whole turn away from 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 that view, um, and and now you have a situation where you know and and partly because profitability is still low, productivity in Britain particularly is very very bad. The margin for, um, you know, for the ruling class to say, okay, we're gonna, we're, we're prepared to make this sacrifice in inverted commas in order to have a more healthy, happy workforce. It's just not there anymore. And so, you know, the attitude of the ruling class to a, a kind of reformist project, a kind of, you know, whatever you want to call it, a state capitalist project or a, or a, a social democratic project, I think is much more. Um, is much more kind of oppositional for for objective reasons, um, really to do with the kind of, you know, the the health of the system and also to do with the fact that, you know, it's not happening elsewhere. So, you know, it'd be a particular disaster for maybe there will be some shift in general towards more statism. I don't think there probably will actually, but maybe there will. But you don't want to be the first, from the capitalist point of view, you don't want to be the first country doing it because you're going to suffer, you know. So I I think there's a kind of, you know, there's quite a deep historical difference. And in that sense, you know, what was, as you say, if you look at the manifesto, uh, the Labour Party manifesto, I mean, it's it's way more radical than anything we've seen in the last 25, 30 years. But it's probably not much. It's probably similar to what was happening in the 70s and early 80s, what was down on paper. But in these circumstances... You know, it's it's much more challenging. It's much more. It actually has a more radical content re- in reality because it will involve 
for it to be carried through, it's going to be carried through in the teeth of um, establishment opposition. That's the truth. Uh, you know, very, very, con very concerted opposition, I believe. What about this uh, surveillance dimension and national security dimension, quote unquote, of this conversation? Um, the UK is one of the most surveilled countries on earth, if I understand correctly. And there's been this sort of, on one hand, again, starting under new labor, this fetishization of metrics, um, is sort of like a substitute for like broader strategy and ambition. If we can say like, I, I remember there was even some metric, uh, I know Mark Fisher wrote about it and there's really funny clips of uh, John Prescott, who was this character talking about how like, we have increased like bird song as a as a government, which of course we want to protect wildlife, but it was a very funny like metricization of everything. And then on the other hand, um, the Snowden, you point out the Snowden and WikiLeaks revelations really point out the depth and scale of the UK role in global surveillance systems and um, and spying. Uh, and, and also there's a really good piece that just came out in the Tribune today that I want to shout out uh, by, uh, by a couple of different co-authors, all of whom I'm friendly with, uh, about uh, the Boris Johnson's support for, uh, the, you know, Jair Bolsonaro and other far right regimes across Latin America that we talk a lot about on this show. When you couple that with Corbyn being somebody who has also been unafraid to be an inter internationalist, you know, he was a advocate very seriously opposed to the invasion of Iraq as an example. What part does the surveillance state conversation come into play foreign and domestic in terms of understanding the election unfolding now? Well, I mean, you know, at one level, I think it is, it's part of the kind of commodification and the, and the, and the sort of, like you say, the, having metrics for everything. It's like, you know, it's, it gives, it's an index of the extent to which kind of um, uh, measurement by, you know, um, by sort of a, a profit calculus or a, a numerical calculus has become dominant right across the, even in the state. And it's a replacement for, you know, it's a weird kind of prop in a way because it's a replacement for actually having a state that, that functions. It just measures instead of functions. It doesn't actually do anything. It kind of unle you know, unleashes the market and then measures. But for what purpose? Because in the end of the day, these corporations that have taken over whole sections of the state, they, they don't actually end up getting punished if they don't, you know, there's, there's, there's no kind of kickback if they don't deliver. And so it's the whole thing is kind of a bit superficial, really. And when it comes to actual all the cameras and everything. I mean, again, what you feel is this is a this is a kind of uh, a, an attempt to make up for the fact that the police numbers have been cut, and that the whole kind of the the, the sort of state engagement in the everyday life of um, of ordinary people, both both positive and negative, is almost been eroded completely. So they just they just watch us. Whether it actually, I mean, obviously it's sinister and it's frightening. Whether it actually translates into a great deal of, um, of, of effective power on the part of the ruling class is a slightly more open question, really. I mean, I think it's, you know, to me it's an index of, of, the, of their lack of legitimacy and their, the kind of mediating institutions that have held British society together, you know, for 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 decades or generations are really breaking apart. Whether the fact they can watch it is going to be a good, a good kind of um, replacement for that is I'm dubious about myself. In terms of uh, Johnson and, and his strategist, Dominique Cummings, that I'd like to hear a little bit more about, are they, are they as savvy as they seem to be? We know from some massive the, the, the Tories, and neither of them are particularly to do with the brains behind the throne. I mean, one of them is that uh, the main one is that they have got lucky with the whole Brexit, which was a kind of weird accident that it happened at all. Um, and, you know, it has played well for because it's become the, the Brexit question has become very, very divisive. 
in both Labour and actually in the Tories, but crucially in this instance, in Labour, um, and or, or in the sort of broadly progressive left. And in particular, Brexit became a it became a kind of lightning rod for people's discontent against the wider status quo. And 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 by the Tories, by being pro Brexit, they've actually managed to and by pushing or by Labour allowing itself to be pushed into a, a more and more openly remain position. It's kind of created a culture war that can be exploited. And that's really the main problem with this election. Um, the other thing that's worth saying, by the way, is that, and this is probably no surprise to your listeners, but it needs to be said because it's so blatant, is the extent to which the media um, terrain is so, so loaded against the left. I mean, there's only one uh, mass circulation or the mainstream media outlet in Britain that is pro-Labour, which is the Daily Mirror. Out of all of the, the 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 outlets, they're all basically hostile, and even the Daily Mirror is not very friendly to Jeremy Corbyn. So there isn't, <clears throat> you know, there's no one in the mainstream batting for him uh, in those, and that's going to have an impact. Um, so so I'm not so sure it's about you know Cummings being this this brilliant strategist. Really, I think it's that the Tories. I mean, and Boris is such an idiot. You know, I mean, he's clearly exposed himself as being you know, a kind of very poor operator. There was all this talk about him being a great communicator. Well, that's obviously not true because they've just tried to keep, kept him locked up in a box throughout the whole right. campaign because they know he's not. So I think it's more the kind of wider context. And if it wasn't for this wider context, I think genuinely that, you know, it would be very much easier for Jeremy, to, for Jeremy Corbyn to have won probably a majority in reality. Yeah, so I mean... Obviously, there's a just stunning media warfare against Corbyn, and I've definitely covered that on on every outlet that I have. And as part of that warfare, I I do want you. I mean, it seems like so much of what's happening in today's politics is that there is a resurgence in interest in let's just broadly say socialism. I think because of objective material conditions and facts. Uh, you know, and, and there's a openness to a much broader set of ideas and really class based analysis in a way that is particularly noticeable in the United States. And then on the other hand, we, you know, we run into these scenarios where it does seem like, and this is very bad, uh, maybe you'll give us some hope in a few minutes, that there still are these just sort of simple culture war elections. And when I say culture war, I don't mean you know, issues at stake, whether we're talking about equity for people, you know, the rights of refugees, fighting racism and so on. I'm talking about culture war elections, which is I am programming different content to different audiences and I'm brand identifying different things. You know, I like Brexit, so I hate sushi. I loathe Brexit and I want sushi. You know, this type of sort of, uh, you know, very much kind of like what TV programs you're vote, you're watching, extension of politics, which erases the class and structural dimensions to it. And it seems like Brexit and the UK have been totally subsumed in that. And that's where people like Tony Blair want, you know, it's not left versus right, it's open versus closed. And I get that we can all analytically reject that, but it still seems to have a salience for a lot of people, particularly when the media is forwarding that narrative. Yeah, I think that's true. And, um, you know, it's a little bit complicated because, in a way, I mean, I would argue that the um, the left hasn't played its cards particularly well on Brexit because, you know, the analysis of why the majority of people who voted voted to leave was always going to be a very crucial question. And I think whole sections of the left and the sort of, you know, the liberal left actually got it wrong and read it simply as a reactionary vote. Uh, without understanding the contradictions of it, the fact that there was a very strong element of it being a rejection of the kind of Westminster elite. Mm -hmm. And also it contained within it a, an element of rationality, in my opinion, which is that, you know, people felt the EU is completely undemocratic and that actually the only democratic institutions we do have, however weak and feeble, they are based on, you know, the national state and parliament and so forth. And that that's actually a higher level of democracy than exists in the EU, which I think is, is personally, I think is 
um, demonstrably true. So the prob I think there has been a problem with the way the left has played it, which has allowed it to become something that can be instrumentalised against them too much. And I think Corbyn has tried his best to, you know, in in a, a hostile world and a hostile context of the Parliamentary Labour Party and even lots of Labour members who I don't think, you know, necessarily took the, you know, didn't quite grasp it in the way that I would have done. Right. So I think there's an element to it. I think, and, and on top of that, I think the other element really has to be understood here is that that relates very, very sort of, it regenerates an already existing sense of betrayal, deep, deep, deep sense of betrayal by all politicians in Britain, which obviously is to do with, you know, particularly in Britain, is to do with the whole Blairite experience and and, and the Iraq war, but also just the way in which Blair, you know, turned the Labour Party completely into a pro-market operation. And again, that's completely rational. I mean, you know, I, how can you blame people for that? And then when you when you have on top, you know, for a lot of us know on the left that, that Corbyn stands for something different. He stands actually for a break from that kind of you know, market, free market consensus and the lying, cynical politics. But, you know, not necessarily, that, ne that message hasn't necessarily got out to the wider world. And Brexit has helped to stop it getting out to the wider world. Because the truth is, Labour, the Labour's position is, you know, it's changed from being one, we will recognise the result of the referendum and go for a people's Brexit, to... Really, we won't recognise the first vote and we're going to have another referendum. And that has created a sense of betrayal around lots of people. So so it kind of is a culture war. But in a way, I think the left has allowed it to become that. Mm. It could have played a, a much, you know, it could have played our hand much more strongly, in my opinion. That's interesting. I mean, that's that's uh, I, I'm going to take that in. That's definitely different than what you hear from literally everybody. Um, so, no, which has a, you know, a good, that's but that's, advent, yeah. I mean, it's always struck me that they've never, I mean, it seems policy wise pretty, you know, that Brexit's definitely a bad call, but they have, ne people have never had an answer when I've ever, anytime I've ever said, okay, there is though a remain, there is a leave vote in labor. What do you do about that? That's always glossed over. Um, and I've never heard an answer to that from anybody who's, you know, advocated that they need to reverse position. In in the final section, Chris, instead of asking you to make a prediction, although obviously if you have any um, optimism that isn't reflected in the polls, that would be great. Can you paint a couple of scenarios for us post-election for a Corbyn project? So there's the worst case scenario. You know, there's a Tory majority they dominate. Maybe there's a much closer election, but still, you know, basically putting the Lib Dems in position uh, to go in and, you know, I think almost certainly team up with the Tories. Uh, people say they won't do that. I don't believe that. I think they certainly would. Or, you know, maybe attempt to instigate some type of like Blairite coup inside labor as a precondition for some type of neoliberal coalition. Or, let's say labor really shockingly overperforms we would still be in some type of coalition situation but i mean obviously that's the most optimistic scenario but the day after what are the kind of three courses you can imagine charting to continue this fight well i mean i i am you know i do think the polls underestimate the labor vote i think that's almost inevitable okay. given who they are and the, there is a long record of that so, you know, personally, I think there probably will be a hung parliament. I mean, that's it's crazy to make predictions because it's such an uncertain situation. But if I had to, I would say that um, there's obviously lots of different uh, versions of a hung parliament. But, yeah, let's go through the scenarios. Labour does very, very well. Um, obviously, that would be uh, everyone's favourite outcome. Uh, I think even then, as I argue in the book, I think what we have to understand that, you know, if Labour got in, um, say, with a kind of support from the SNP, which is probably the best outcome we can expect at the moment, then um, I, even then there'd be all sorts of manoeuvres against Corbyn. I mean, I, I think that's, that's, that's dead cert. 
I think the people in the, I mean, the, we just had the thing today, John Ashworth, I don't know if you've heard about it, but he's the uh, shadow minister for the health. He's been, had, there's a recording circulating that he had a conversation with a Tory uh, where he was basically saying, you know, that the Labour right are just biding their time. They want to move against Corbyn. You know, this stuff is going to happen. Right. So, so that's, that's, um, that's one scenario. The, the, the other scenario is, you know, some sort of more chaotic situation um, with possible. I, I'm actually very skeptical about a Lib Dem Tory alliance myself because I just don't know how they deal with the Brexit question on either side, really, because they're so they're so at loggerheads on that. But I mean, you know, you're right. You can't rule it out. Um, that, on the other hand, would be an extremely difficult situation. And this is an element that we've got to understand here. You know, the, the situation is difficult for the left, but it's very, very difficult for the right. I mean, you know, there's all sorts of problems. And partly the, the fundamental problem they've got is the British ruling class is pro-EU. They have a very, very crazy, incompetent leader of the Labour Party, a leader of the Tory party, who is, you know, has decided to become a big Brexiteer. So the main party of the British ruling class, one of the most successful capitalist parties in the whole world is pursuing a, a policy on one of the key questions of the day, directly in contradiction to that of its, its economic masters. That is a fundamental problem that British capitalism is going to have to face, and it's not pretty. Plus, you know, he's an extremely, I mean, Boris is an extremely divisive and polarising character. So if he does get into number 10, there's going to be absolute I mean, especially if it's with some weird alliance with the Lib Dems. I mean, it's going to be political pandemonium. That's the truth. I mean, obviously, the whole of the left will be very, very demoralised and depressed and there'll be the whole massive debate going on about that. But I think what I think that, you know, and, and if the Tories do well as well, that will be, be devastating. But even then, I don't see it being a period of social calm. I just don't. Because the forces that have given rise to Corbyn, I mean, Corbynism isn't an accident. People talk about, you know, the changing of the, the election rules, the, the internal Labour Party leadership election rules, and that was important. But fundamentally, it wasn't, a, it wasn't an accident. It was an expression of a mass popular rejection of Blairism, basically, on the left. It was an, it was a, it was an expression of a sense that things have got to change, that neoliberalism is just not working, that it's causing misery, it's, it's dysfunctional. Everything in Britain is dysfunctional. The railways, the hospitals, the social services. It's, it's a, we're in a, in a society which is, people experience as being very hostile and very, um, and, and very kind of, you know, uh, 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 falling apart, essentially. And in those circumstances, you know, this is where Corbynism comes from. And I think one of the things you've got to take on uh, away from the election is that there's been a huge engagement by activists in it. I mean, the canvassing has been phenomenal. I think it's probably been the biggest, you know, election operation there's been, really, in terms of the activism. And that tells me about something about the left, which is that there is actually a very big, very vibrant, and actually quite active left in Britain which you couldn't have said, you, you wouldn't really have said, you know, a decade ago or a couple of decades ago in a way. And, and, and that's very important. And, you know, that, that left, although it will be, I think people may be surprised by the re-election result in a good way, but, but if the result is bad, that left isn't going to go away. People will get very demoralised and there'll be a lot of soul searching. But I do think that that left will have to, you know, reconsider its its positions, um, and you know, I, it's impossible to predict exactly what that will mean. But one thing I think it should mean is that we need to seriously rebuild the kind of extra parliamentary left, because in any of these scenarios, whether it's the Tories doing well or or the or Jeremy doing much better than expected. Even in that scenario, there's going to be huge attachment in the establishment. There's going to be questions and challenges that can't be answered in Parliament and, you know, or simply by parliamentary action. And we need to be in a position where people can come out onto the streets and we can have a participatory mass movement or series of interlinked mass movements 
working with the unions that have a penetration into the work the workplaces that you know that can actually start to to make a difference in this situation because i mean i'm a big corbyn fan and i'm a fan of corbynism but in a way one of the potential downsides of what's happened is that lots of people who have been spent you know a large a number of years organizing in their workplaces or in their streets have been totally taken up in the parliamentary process or the process of parliamentary politics and i think that's not sufficient and it won't be sufficient to deal with any of the scenarios that are, that are potentially coming out of this election right uh, this is exactly so the same uh scenario that happens in the united states by the way from the Best case scenario of a Sanders presidency to yeah. the atrocity, you know, of a second Trump term to just the kind of middling garbage of another Democrat. There has <laughs> to be these outside forces that isn't just and it's funny because it's kind of a left cliche, which is why I think in some ways you got to you know resist it at times like, oh, well, you know, people just need to be out organizing more. But at the same time, people need to be out organizing more in they any scenario. But the weird thing is that it's a left cliche that is now a, a very minority voice on the left in the sense that, and, and, and you know, in the sense that, um, that people are really taken up with the whole electoral thing, which is absolutely fine. And, you know, I've been at canvassing and that's exactly what the left needs to be doing at this moment. But the argument, which, as you say, should be cliche, a cliche, should be sort of standard, which is that whatever happens in Parliament, we need the unions need to be strong, the social movements need to be strong, because we will have to get out there to force the right back, or to support the left in Parliament, or or to or to take on a new Tory government. That that argument isn't really being put anywhere. And one of the things I think if you look at the last 20 years of the left in Europe and in America is that I, I can discern a certain pattern, which is that you get these big social movement moments or periods when there's massive you know, anti-war or anti-austerity or uh, uh, mobilizations and sometimes big strikes and so forth. They then in certain circumstances lead to the creation of new parliamentary or electoral left projects. Um, and when they're quite successful, suddenly everyone forgets about the street. And I mean, you know, that's right. what happened in, um, in Italy in the mid part of the last decade with Rifondazioni. It's what happened most obviously with Syriza in Greece. And I think we've got to be a bit more sophisticated than that. And we've got to not get into a cycle of kind of mass movements, parliamentary expression, disappointment, back to the mass movements. You know, I mean, I think we need to have a kind of, dare I say, a bit more of a dialectical approach to this and think, yes, the electoral, um, the electoral element of a left strategy, the kind of parliamentary electoral element of a left strategy is important, is crucial, but it's never the most important thing, actually, or maybe it is for a few weeks, but... You know, in terms of a slightly broader time scale, it, it always has to be connected to something that is going on in the communities. And and, and this even applies to the question of the vote, to be honest, because if there was a more, a, a, a less, a, a sort of more active engagement uh, of the wider mass movements and the unions in the election, and not just knocking on doors, but actually organising protests and street meetings and so on and so forth, then we'd be in a better place with the election. Right. So, so I'm just, right. this is one of the arguments of my book, you know, against the kind of the flipping from one to the other and against the idea that politics is mainly what happens in Parliament. Chris Nineham, the book is The British State, A Warning. It's an excellent book. It's published by my publisher, Zero Books. If you are in the UK, Jesus Christ, go out and vote for the Labour Party. Chris, Thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate your time. Be nice talking, Michael. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. All right, folks. We do so much on the show. We really do. Um, actually, I think, and honestly, that's it's a really good book, and I would check out all of Chris's videos on the Zero Books channel, which everybody should be subscribing to if they haven't already. Um, all of Doug's stuff is really insightful. Um, 
there was just a major piece of reporting in the Washington Post, and I'm going to take a little bit of time. We would normally do this in a post game, but I'll do this in the main show. Uh, basically documenting that throughout the entire Bush, Obama, and Trump eras, there has been systemic lying and disinformation on the part of the U.S. government and different administrations on what exactly is happening in Afghanistan. Multiple shifting rationales for why we're there. Uh, constant efforts to spin and formulate uh, uh, successes that are not existing. Uh, and basically, you have a war now that's longer than Vietnam. I believe Afghanistan is the longest ongoing war in U.S. history that has consumed an incredible amount of lives, U.S. soldiers, endless Afghani civilians, where you are in a situation where basically the Ashraf Ghani government controls about half of the country. The rest is by various factions of the Taliban. This has deepened and created all sorts of new problems in terms of the U.S. and Pakistani relationship. It has been a boon in some respects for the Pakistani intelligence services, ISI, who play a double game with the CIA and the Taliban. Everybody should read Steve Call's Directorate S book. It's also had an enormously damaging effect on Central Asia and on Pakistan. Uh, the war, of course, has been conducted most aggressively under Obama with the drone program in Pakistan that killed a significant amount of Pakistani civilians and caused a new layer of instability there. We don't know the exact amount of civilians because the drone program civilian casualty rates have never been properly measured, but we do know that all civilian casualty rates are skyrocketing under Trump. I'm going to quote a little bit from Juan Cole, who wrote a great piece um, we didn't need documents. America's trillion dollar failure in the Afghanistan war has been obvious all along. Um, basically, a lot of reporting of Whitlock's articles focused on U.S. government lies and misrepresentations about so-called progress on the war front. But this was all along obvious to anyone who knows anything serious about Afghanistan and Pakistan. Our Madison Avenue advertising culture gives the U.S. government the tools to pull the wools over people's heads. Government spokesmen in the forever wars have just two categories, progress and slow progress. In a, a epochal disaster, like losing a whole province is slower progress than we would like. Um, and he goes on to just talk about the various massive blunders here. Let's go through a little bit of like uh, of, of history here. This is George W. Bush. Remember, after September 11th, this goes back to the 1980s. This goes, all of these relationships were formed during the US, Saudi and Pakistani support of the Mujahideen fight against the Soviet Union. Then their, Afghanistan is, a, is abandoned. It's multi-warlord factions. The Taliban rise in the mid 90s. And initially there's actually some really positive overtures with the United States because there's pipeline deals to be had. Osama bin Laden is there. They're hosting him in Al-Qaeda, and he's got a huge amount of money to dispense, and still almost certainly different links to various parts of the Saudis. So this is George W. Bush after September 11th. There's, of course, not going to be any strategic response. There's not going to be any humane response. There's going to be a massive bombing and onslaught against Afghanistan. And really importantly, this whole war on terrorism framework, even though we don't use that language anymore, is still 20 years later how we conduct all of our global military policy. This is still the framework upon a AUMF, which has never been reformed. There was just a massive military spending bill that, of course, the Democrats totally rolled on that given to all Saudi demands on their genocide in Yemen that would allow the Trump administration to use AMF, uh, AUMF uh, money and authority to attack Iran and does nothing uh, to hold any of this back. This is George W. Bush launching it back after the September 11th attack, several weeks after. Good afternoon. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. These carefully targeted actions are designed to disrupt the use of Afghanistan as a terrorist base of operations and to attack the military capability of the Taliban regime. 
Now, this went on for multiple years, and after initially uh, sort of claiming success by essentially putting the Northern Alliance into power, dispersing the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, and again, uh, a, a huge amount of civilian casualties, loss of U.S. life, um, Afghanistan just kept going and going, and it was not successful. In fact, it was destabilizing Pakistan. Uh, there was all sorts of, uh, you know, not all sorts of reporting, it was still pretty underreported then of problems in the Karzai government. Then Barack Obama comes along and he's not an anti-war candidate. He's an anti-dumb war candidate. So the invasion of Iraq is dumb and not intelligent, not a war crime. And we need to focus on the smart war in Afghanistan, which is pretty clear to anybody uh, very early on uh, with any historical awareness is unwinnable. But Obama still makes a Machiavellian calculation to surge troops in Afghanistan uh, under military pressure and with political calculation. This review is now complete. And as commander in chief, I have determined that it is in our vital national interest to send an additional 30,000 U.S. troops to Afghanistan. After 18 months, our troops will begin to come home. These are the resources that we need to seize the initiative while building the Afghan capacity that can allow for a responsible transition of our forces out of Afghanistan. I do not make this decision lightly. I oppose the war in Iraq precisely because I believe that we must exercise restraint in the use of military force and always consider the long-term consequences of our actions. We have been at war now for eight years, at enormous cost in lives and resources. Years of debate over Iraq and terrorism have left our unity on national security issues in tatters and created a highly polarized and partisan backdrop for this effort. And having just experienced the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, the American people are understandably focused on rebuilding our economy and putting people to work here at home. Now, Obama would actually make an, a very odd play, which is he would promise to pull those troops out after 18 months of going in. And then you heard a lot in this time period with General McChrystal and General Petraeus, basically about replicating what they did in Iraq, which was sold as a surge that was effective. But really what it was, was going to Sunni leadership across the country and saying, look, we're going to protect some of your rights economically and otherwise, and here are bags of cash, which was much more persuasive than the surge, but not replicatable in Afghanistan for a variety of reasons, including a huge amount of broader just sort of political illiteracy about even just as an example, the different ethnic factions inside the Afghan context. It continues on. We're rolling right through, including, of course, an accelerated drone warfare and the relationship with Pakistan. And then this guy became president. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. 52 compared to thousands, and uh, we're doing a tremendous job. And as you know, a big part of that job is ISIS, certainly the biggest, and Al Qaeda. And we, uh, we've got them down very low numbers. We'll have that totally taken care of in a very short period of time. And we'll see what happens. Uh, the Taliban wants to make a deal. We'll see if they want to make a deal. It's got to be a real deal, but we'll see. But they want to make a deal. And they only want to make a deal because you're doing a great job. That's the only reason they want to make a deal. So I want to thank you, and I want to thank the Afghan soldiers for really uh, – I've spoken to a lot of you today, and you say they're really fighting hard. I was very impressed with that, actually. So I want to thank you. So that's Donald Trump, who, of course, in the first couple of uh, months in his administration, authorized an operation uh, that killed uh, multiple civilians right out of the gate. Uh, when he became president, and then also uh, dropped a massive payload bomb in Afghanistan in 2017. That was just the mother of all bombs. Mother of all bombs. That's only because they don't have a father of all bombs. <laughs> right. And then uh, Lindsey Graham, uh, the ultra hawk, has been saying, according to Indian media reports, that this could all end if the Pakistanis would just stop supporting the Taliban, which is basically like saying, like, Yes, this could all end if we had immediate world peace or if the United States stopped supporting the intelligence services in Pakistan that support the Taliban. These things are 
slightly complicated, unfortunately, and there's a nexus of relationships that don't work for anybody. Three months ago, negotiations with the Taliban were canceled and they are resuming again as of yesterday. Talks between the United States and the Taliban resumed this weekend, three weeks after President Donald Trump abruptly canceled negotiations aimed at ending America's longest war. News of the, of the talks came just before the Washington Post obtained a report of more than 2,000 pages of government documents that they say it shows how U.S. officials for years have misled the public about the war in Afghanistan. And uh, NBC News has contacted the White House, State Department, and Pentagon for comment, and the U.S., Taliban talks have restarted in the Qatari capital of Doha on Saturday with the goal of reducing violence and the laying groundwork of the peace talks between the Taliban and Afghan government, a State Department spokesperson told NBC News. Now, could you have going back to 2001 have isolated more extreme versions of the Taliban and gotten them to give up Osama bin Laden? Definitely, possibly. Could you have done surgical and precise operations against a discrete security threat instead of a massive global war regime that has cost millions of people's lives and wasted a huge amount of money and had a global rise in surveillance? Yes, you could have. And this all goes back to the ahistorosity and, if that's even a word, an insane warmongering that happened after the terrorist attacks of September 11th and we're still there. Like, it's like background noise. Like, oh, yeah, we just killed a wedding party. So that's Afghanistan. Whoops. Now, there's a lot of talk about impeachment. And there's a lot of, you know, I think we've charted the course that's obvious, which is that Donald Trump has committed multiple crimes. The whole point of a political project is to damage him, ideally. I think the verdict remains open, though I think that it's going to be a wash, not a disaster, and potentially positive if it plays out correctly. If this was something on Trump's concentration camps or, or a simple financial corruption, yes, I do think it would be significantly more compelling, both morally, strategically, and politically. Do all of the sets of policies around Ukraine that people uncritically repeat verbatim without any understanding of them beyond as a cudgel of attacking Trump, are they, is that problematic? Without a doubt. Is there a broader national security conversation that needs to be had? Of course. But that's not what the Trump administration is doing. And this is another interesting contradiction on the left. For all of the dumb liberals that have no systemic understanding of U.S. foreign policy and nothing beyond Trump, which we already know is a fundamental problem that we have to deal with. There's some people on the left who take, I think, what Trump says at face value. The reality is, is that in most areas, he's amplifying U.S. empire. Now, it's a dying empire. It's a retreating empire because of other power dynamic shifts that any president would have to deal with. But in the main, there's massive kinetic activity across the globe. There's aggressive regime change efforts across the hemisphere. There's an untold amount of civilian casualties. And in the main, he's even actually opposed in reality an aggressive policy in Eastern Europe and in Russia, even as he's trashed NATO. So we can't retreat back to the previous consensus, which was unjust and dangerous, but we also can't, um, we need to take advantage of the chaos that he's created while also recognizing that in the main, he's just an extreme version of what already existed. That's Abby Martin's whole point. She's 100% right. And we need to use impeachment effectively against him. And this clip of Nancy Pelosi does reveal so many of the American elite's priorities and the fact that Iraqi lives don't mean a fucking thing to any of these people. This is Nancy Pelosi getting asked about impeaching George W. Bush. So, uh, Speaker Pelosi, uh, you resisted calls for the impeachment of President Bush in 2006 and President Trump following the Mueller report earlier this year. Uh, this time is different. Uh, why did you impose? Why did you oppose impeachment in the past? And what is your obligation to protect our democracy from the actions of our president now? Thank you. I thank you for bringing up the question about because when I became speaker the first time, it was overwhelming call for me to impeach President Bush on the strength of the war in Iraq. 
which I vehemently opposed. And again, I, again, I, I, I say again, I said, said it other places. I, I, that was my wheelhouse. I was intelligence. I was a ranking member on the intelligence committee uh, even before I became part of the leadership of Gang of Four. So I knew there were no nuclear weapons in Iraq. It just wasn't there. They had to show us, they had to show the Gang of Four all the intelligence they had. The intelligence did not show that uh, that, that was the case. So I knew it was a, a misrepresentation to the public. But having said that, it was a, in my view, uh, not a grounds for impeachment. Uh, that was, they won the election, they made a representation, and to this day, people think, people think that, um, that it was the right thing to do. The people think that Iraq had something to do with 9-11. I mean, it's as appalling what they did. Uh, but I did, and I said, if somebody wants to make a case, you bring it forward. Uh, but I, I, they had impeached... That was the case. Well, I mean, literally, what could be a more relevant thing to impeach somebody for than lying about intelligence to invade a country? I like how she says they won an election and then made a representation. They I, sure yeah. did. Yeah. That's some Washington speak for you. I mean, that's mind blowing. And that is that great David Feldman joke. She didn't want to impeach Trump either. And Feldman said, when they implicated the ability of the children of Democratic Party elites to make money on lobbying, they crossed the Rubicon. Nancy Pelosi recognized that. So that's disgusting, and it's very revealing of a mindset. Guys, become a patron today, patreon.com slash TMBS. See us at the Bell House February 7th. I want to thank everybody that makes this show possible. We have a ton to get to in the post game. So let's go do just that. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.